This is the African American Civil War Memorial in Washington, D.C. The monument lists the names of 209,145 black soldiers who gallantly fought for their freedom in the Civil War, as well as their white officers. The following video tells a long forgotten story of the black struggle from slave to soldier to citizen. This documentary is funded by a grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, helping people help themselves. This experience, the military involvement of African Americans, was the most massive single operation of the nation in the 19th century. I was kind of struck by the fact that everybody, you know, had known it as Colored Soldiers Row, but there were not that many marked graves along there, and it's largely an empty section, which got my students and myself kind of curious about, well, you know, can we get markers? You know, certainly these men deserve markers. We placed the names of all 209,000 on a Civil War memorial here in Washington, D.C., in granite and, 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 and stainless steel. You can't hide them anymore now. They're on a national monument. If the muse were mine to tempt it, and my feeble voice were strong, if my tongue were trained to measures, I would sing a stirring song. I would sing a song heroic of those noble sons of Ham, of the gallant colored soldiers who fought for Uncle Sam. For their blood has cleansed completely every blot of slavery shame, so all honor and all glory to those noble sons of Ham, the gallant colored soldiers who fought for Uncle Sam. Freedom, oh, freedom the question of slavery was left unresolved by the founding fathers. Political tensions mounted throughout the 19th century. In October 1859, an abolitionist from Kansas named John Brown was hanged for leading a raid on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Brown was planning to use the weapons to forcefully free slaves in Virginia. With his last words before being hanged, John Brown predicted that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. Eighteen months later, on April 12, 1861, the Civil War between the North and the South begins with the South's attack on Union troops stationed at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. The outbreak of the war launches a heated debate over the use of African-American troops on both sides of the conflict. In my grave. Georgia Senator Howell Cobb. If a black man can make a good soldier, our whole system of government is wrong. President Abraham Lincoln. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Frederick Douglass. Colored men, good enough to fight under Washington, but not McClellan. Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens. Our Confederacy is founded upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man that slavery subordination to the superior race is the natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical and moral truth. Colored citizens of Boston Resolution. The traitors of the South have assailed the United States government with the intention of overthrowing it for the purpose of perpetuating slavery. Our feelings urge us to say to our countrymen that we are ready to stand by, to defend the government as the equals of its white defenders, to do so with our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor for the sake of freedom and as good citizens. And we ask you to modify your laws that we may enlist. Both North and South decide against enlisting African Americans at the start of the war, the Union decides not to use African-American troops because slavery is still legal in the border states, 
and Lincoln is very concerned about losing any state to the Confederacy. May 24, 1861, less than two months after the start of the war, General Butler accepts runaway slaves who cross Union lines and declares them contraband of war. Butler enlists these men as laborers who help build fortifications. By August 1861, Congress passes the first Confiscation Act that states runaway or captured slaves cannot be returned if their masters are using them as a military support. The Union is convinced that the South's labor force, slaves, would help them to victory. The institution of slavery in the South alone enables her to place in the field a force much larger in proportion to her white population than the North. It is really one of the most effective weapons employed against the Union by the South. Montgomery Advertiser, 1861. But Lincoln is keenly aware of the risk involved with the arming of African Americans. To arm the Negroes would turn 50,000 bayonets from the loyal border states against us. With the shortage of reinforcements, momentum starts to build toward using some of the contrabands to help fight the rebels. People like General Hunter and General Rufus Saxton and even Colonel Lane out in Kansas, on their own at the state level, recruit blacks for the military. Six months into the conflict, in August 1861, John Fremont, Union commander in Missouri, delivers a proclamation declaring all slaves who take up arms with the Union will be set free. President Lincoln asked him to modify his order. When he refuses, Lincoln fires Fremont. However, after a public outcry, he is reinstated as head of the Army Mountain Department out in the West, where he is no longer directly involved with this issue. Secretary of War Simon Cameron is the first top-ranking official to support the enlistment of black troops to fight with the Union forces. In his annual report in December 1861, Cameron refuses to delete a passage that advocates emancipation of the slaves and the employment of former slaves as military laborers and soldiers. He states, the government has the right, even a duty, to arm the slaves. Because of his concern over losing the border states, Lincoln fires him and replaces him with Secretary Edwin Stanton. Secretary Simon Cameron lost his job because he misread what Lincoln had said privately about blacks and freedom, saying, in effect, uh, if the president privately feels this way, let me be a good cabinet member and promote this uh, by encouraging these generals to do this. Almost a year into the war, in March 1862, Congress adopts an additional article of war, which prohibits, under the threat of court-martial, the return of all slaves to their masters. Out in Kansas, Brigadier James Lane ignores War Department directives and forms the first Kansas Colored Volunteers. He calls on slaves from Arkansas and Missouri to flee to Kansas and fight for the Union. Under Lane's direction, blacks are enthusiastic to enlist and fight. The New York Times, August 17, 1862. In October 1862, the first Kansas Volunteers become the first colored troops to actually engage in combat, repulsing a superior force of rebel guerrillas near Butler, Missouri. The men fought like tigers, each and every one of them. The Leavenworth Conservative, October 1862. In South Carolina, Union General David Hunter is frustrated by the lack of reinforcements. Hunter attempts to take matters into his own hands by calling for the emancipation of slaves from Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. He also creates the first South Carolina Colored Regiment. When General Hunter raised among fugitive slaves the first South Carolina Black Regiment at Hilton Head, the officers of his corps, being still uneducated to the times, refused to associate with the few brave men who took command of the Negroes. And Secretary Stanton, still barely stammering over the ABC of the work, 
declines to pay them wages because their skins were too dark. Harper's Weekly Editorial, June 20, 1863. Hunter's response is, Never mind. The fools are bigots who refuse or are enough punished by their refusal. Before two years, they will be competing eagerly for the commission they now reject. You did have aborted, let's say, brigades of, of, of such troops. Aborted in that, in, in, in that most of them were never put on the payroll of the feds because they were not authorized. And Lincoln uh, finally said, no, this is not the time to do this. You don't have the authority to do it. Hunter is not allowed to emancipate slaves in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina as he requested. But shortly afterward, General Rufus Saxton is authorized to organize the first official army regiment of runaway slaves to be based at Sea Island of St. Helena, South Carolina. The colonel of the first South Carolina volunteers is Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Higginson is a staunch believer in racial equality. He writes General Saxton. This equality in war is the guarantee of the ultimate civil equality, which you and I might not live to see, but for which these men in military service can never doubt their fitness. In July 1862, Lincoln signs the Second Confiscation Act, stating that all slaves who support or aid the rebellion will be freed upon coming into Union territory. The act gives the president the right to employ blacks for the repression of the rebellion. General Benjamin Butler calls for black volunteers from newly captured New Orleans. Butler convinces the French-speaking Corps d'Afrique, the first regiment of Louisiana Native Guards, to join the Union forces. In August 1862, Congress finally authorizes the use of funds for colored troops, but they receive $10 a month instead of the $13 a month that the white soldiers receive. They are also charged $3 a month for their uniforms, making their pay little more than half of their white contemporaries. President Lincoln is encouraged by Senator Charles Sumner to formally announce the Emancipation Proclamation on July 4, 1862. Lincoln, feeling the Union needed a battlefield success prior to making the announcement, waits until after the victory at Antietam on September 17, 1862. Five days later, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. It states that all slaves in those states or portions of states still in rebellion as of January 1, 1863, will be declared free. It also pledges monetary support for slave states not in rebellion that adopt either immediate or gradual emancipation. There's no question about the fact that once Lincoln decided to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, he changed the war from being a war where he was just trying to bring the South back into the Union or reunite the country to a war down for the abolition of slavery. Some folks say the Emancipation Proclamation did not free anybody legally, and that's not untrue. But it freed the minds of people, including the minds of the enslaved. Let the proclamation go wherever the army goes. Let it go wherever the Navy secures a foothold on the outer border of the rebel territory and let it summon to our aid the Negroes who are truer to the Union than their disloyal masters. It placed us right in the eyes of the world and transferred men's sympathies from a Confederacy fighting for independence as a means of establishing slavery to a nation whose institutions mean constitutional liberty and, when fairly wrought out, must end in universal freedom. Anonymous Civil War Reporter. It was not simply a political level, it was now a moral level and it was a universal moral level, uh, saying that the buying and selling of human beings in civilized societies is coming to an end. And I think they caught this. And it also had the effect of keeping the, 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 the proclamation of inhibiting English commercial folks, especially in textiles, from attempting to continue to try to do business with the Southerners who were paranoid when this thing came out. For the slaves and for the rest of the people in the country, they had to have known that once you take a person, you put him in a U.S. uniform, you, you give him a rifle and bullets in his pocket, and you turn him back loose into those places where he had been a slave before with his rifle and with all the support of the federal government behind him, he's never going to be re-enslaved again. 
that had then the effect of morally and economically isolating the South from the rest of the world. And that greatly uh, accelerated the uh, movement towards victory. Shortly after the Emancipation Proclamation, the Massachusetts 54th and 55th recruits free colored men. Frederick Douglass actively recruits men from all over the free states to fight for the Mass 54th. He sends two of his sons to join them. Frederick Douglass, March 2nd, 1863. Massachusetts now welcomes you to arms as soldiers. She has but a small colored population from which to recruit. Go quickly and fill up the first colored regiment from the north. Colonel Shaw and the men of the Mass 54th get a hero send-off as they leave Boston on their way to South Carolina. Finally, in the spring of 1863, the Mass 54th and 55th, the South Carolina 1st and 2nd, and the Louisiana 1st and 2nd, and all the other various statewide regiments are incorporated into the new Bureau of U.S. Colored Troops, or USCT. The Civil War Memorial has established May 22nd as Founders Day because May 22nd, 1863 is the day that Abraham Lincoln established the Bureau of U.S. Colored Troops. And the Bureau of U.S. Colored Troops' responsibility was to recruit, train, uniform, and then deploy black soldiers. It is the first time that black soldiers are brought into the military and allowed to stand as patriots in defense of their own freedom. It changed the course of this war. It changed the course of American history. After finally being granted the right to fight for the Union Army, these black soldiers still had to face the reality that many of their fellow white soldiers were angry about fighting alongside colored troops. President Lincoln is particularly worried about a backlash from the border states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. They are critical to the Union due to their proximity to the Confederacy and their deep political and familiar ties to both North and South. As non-Confederate states, they did not have to comply with the Emancipation Proclamation, allowing them to remain slaveholders. Although Lincoln has been urging these border states to voluntarily emancipate their slaves since 1861, he remains in fear of losing them to the Confederacy. General Fennell has just informed me that you have ordered the enrollment of free Negroes for military service in Kentucky. There are only 4,130 free male Negroes in the state. One-eighth of them is a fair estimate of those between the ages of 18 and 45, giving less than 700. If you gain these, you will lose more than 10,000. You will revolutionize the state and do infinite and inconceivable harm. And I am sure this is all wrong. And there is not an honest, loyal man in the state in favor of it. I beg you to change your order on the subject. Brigadier General Jeremiah T. Boyle to President Lincoln, June 25, 1863. The first major battles of the Civil War that involve colored troops take place in Louisiana. The 1st and 2nd Louisiana Native Guards see combat at Port Hudson in the battle for control of the Mississippi River. The fighting that occurs at Port Hudson on May 27, 1863 and Milliken's Bend on June 6, 1863 is some of the bloodiest of the Civil War. General Ullman is very impressed with the efforts of the colored troops. They made six or seven charges against the enemy's works. They were exposed to terrible fire and were dreadfully slaughtered. While it may be doubtful whether it was wise to so expose them, all who witnessed these charges agree that their conduct was such as would do honor to any soldiers. The conduct of these regiments on this occasion wrought marvelous change in the opinion of many former sneerers. Milliken's Bend settles the question that the Negro can fight. In fact, General Nathaniel Banks, no friend of the colored soldiers, reporting on Milliken's Bend and Port Hudson said, it gives me great pleasure to report that they answered every expectation. Their conduct was heroic. No troops were more determined or more daring. New York Times Editorial, June 1863. Not only did it give the, the, the Union Army uh, 200,000 soldiers and manpower that it needed to help run the war, it also took 
150,000 of these 200,000 have been slaves before. They were in the deep south on these plantations. Confederate President Jefferson Davis is incensed that the Union is stealing their property and using it against them. He knew these fugitive slaves would provide critically needed reinforcements for the Union Army, possibly leading them to victory. The Confederates issued that Jeff Davis uh, an order saying that all of the blacks who were captured, and not only just the blacks, but their white officers who were captured were going to be either killed or they were going to be enslaved. And the white officers were going to be subjected to hard labor. Harper's weekly reports on the treatment that Confederate troops give to the captured colored soldiers. On the 6th of June, 1863, there was an engagement at Milliken's Bend between 200 colored troops and an overwhelming number of rebels. A large number of Negroes were murdered in the field after they surrendered. Some were shot, some were put to death by bayonet, some were crucified and burned. Many of the white officers who were commanding the black troops met the same fate. Harper's Weekly, May 21, 1864. Lincoln responds with his eye for an eye policy. The response by Lincoln seems to improve the treatment of black prisoners by the South. Now, to Lincoln's credit, he was one of those guys that took a long time to make up his mind, but once he made up his mind, he was tough. He fired back to the Confederates that if they started to treat black soldiers like that, for every black soldier that they tried to re-enslave or punish, he was going to punish uh, white soldiers, and there is uh, the Confederates that were captured. General Robert E. Lee is more pragmatic than some of the other Confederate generals. He knows the South has to counter this military advantage. With his encouragement, the Confederacy begins to debate the merits of enlisting colored troops. General Robert E. Lee. The employment of Negro troops greatly increase our military strength and enable us to relieve our white population. It would disappoint the hopes which our enemies have upon our exhaustion, deprive them in a great measure of aid they now derive from black troops, and thus throw the burden of war upon their own people. General Clement H. Stevens. I do not want independence if it is to be won by the help of the Negro. The justification of slavery in the South is the inferiority of the Negro. If we make him a soldier, we concede the whole question. It wasn't until March of 1865 that the Confederacy then, uh, did agree that they would blame blacks into the Confederate Army, but they would bring in free blacks who had been freed by their master voluntarily, and only those blacks who came into the Army would be freed. So it was not an Emancipation Proclamation that they were talking about. They were talking about freeing the guys who actually fought uh, in the military. On the other hand, the 200,000 men the Union enlists play a significant role in the last two years of the war. The members of the Mass 54th receive the most widespread and lasting fame. Colonel Shaw requests more of a role for his fighting men. On July 18, 1863, his commanding general agrees. The men of the Mass 54th will lead the attack on Fort Wagner. They are met with overwhelming numbers of Confederate soldiers and endure a tremendous number of casualties, including Colonel Shaw and the 54th Regimental Color Bearer. Sergeant William Carney seizes the flag and leads the attack to the Union's deepest penetration of the battle. He is twice wounded and forced to retreat, but Carney manages to return to his cheering comrades with the flag never having touched the ground. For his heroic effort, Carney becomes the first African American Medal of Honor winner. Colonel Shaw is buried with his men in a mass grave. Given the opportunity to move him to a proper burial site, his family declines, feeling he would rather be buried with his men. In February 1864, Congress passes the Conscription Act. It enables both slaves and free men to enlist. Providing financial incentives to slave owners in the border states leads to the enlistment of thousands of slaves across the country. This enormous influx of reinforcements provides the Union forces with much needed manpower manpower that leads to the final conclusive drive to victory. Of all of the hundreds of thousands, said the 200,000 folks black who were involved, 23,000 plus about 700 came out of Kentucky. Camp Nelson becomes the largest recruiting depot for African Americans in Kentucky and the third largest in the nation. After the Conscription Act, 10,000 slaves and free men train at Camp Nelson. John Taylor was one of those men. 
Stephen Jackson recently finished a biography on the life of his great-great-grandfather, John Taylor, for his history class with Paul LaRue. One of his most important sources was his grandfather, John Jackson, who was 10 years old when his grandfather, John Taylor, died at the age of 106. Stephen came down to the house and wanted to know if I knew any Civil War veterans. I told him, your grandpa, your great-great-grandpa was a Civil War veteran, and he was buried out there in the Washington Cemetery. He was in the 116th, which was one of a large number of regiments that were formed at Camp Nelson, Kentucky. The 116th, like a number of regiments, ended up doing duty at the Dutch Gap Canal. And it was a somewhat ill-conceived idea of shortening the distance by cutting a canal through. The Confederate gunners figured this out, and these guys were basically target practice for the Confederate gunners. And in John Taylor's own words, he says, we were out on detail working, the shell hit and blew a bank up, and it shattered my ankle. And there were actually two officers from his regiment who received a Congressional Medal of Honor, one of them for duty at the Dutch Gap. While the Dutch Gap experiment proves fruitless, the USCT troops play a significant role in the final decisive battles of the Civil War. With the drive toward Richmond bogged down for almost a year, major battles break out near Petersburg, Virginia, a railroad hub some 20 miles south of Richmond. Newmarket Heights becomes one of the dramatic engagements involving black troops during the Civil War. General Baldy Smith's troops come under Confederate artillery fire near Baylor's farm. The men slog through a swampy patch, then charge up a slope against point-blank fire. They drive the rebels off, but lose 100 men. With the enemy outpost captured, the 3,000 men lead a charge across an open field to capture the battery. They take 200 prisoners, but according to Sergeant Major Fleetwood, the 4th USCT alone lose 250 men out of their complement of 600. General Smith is effusive with his praise during his account to the Assistant Secretary of War, Charles Dana, who comes to visit General Grant at Petersburg. The Negro troops fought magnificently, the hardest fighting being done by them. Lincoln, when he visits General Grant's encampment, comments, I want to look at those boys. I read with greatest delight the account given in Mr. Dana's dispatch to the Secretary of War how gallantly they behaved. Sometime in the fire. Immediately following New Market Heights, after two failed Union assaults, nine officers and 189 men of the 7th USCT storm nearby Fort Gilmer. All but one are killed, wounded, or captured. The combined engagements, known as the Battle for Chapin's Farm, ends the next morning with 1,173 black casualties and 14 Medal of Honor winners. General Benjamin Butler, who once offered his federal troops to aid the governor of Maryland for the purpose of stopping a slave rebellion, and who is now leading the Army of the James, said, A few more such gallant charges, and to command colored troops will be the post of honor in the American armies. Sometime in the water. What Butler discerned after the Battle uh, of New Market Heights, uh, right around uh, Petersburg, was that these guys had been such good soldiers that he really wanted to create his own medal called the Butler Medal, uh, where he could award medals to these guys who had been so instrumental there in the Battle of New Market Heights and the Siege of Richmond. John Taylor and the 116th USCT are with the Army of the James in its pursuit of General Lee to Appomattox Courthouse in April 1865. The 116th was one of the 17 regiments deployed along an assault line west of Appomattox that moved eastward and prevented General Lee's army from escaping westward. John Taylor was in Company C of the 116th. Major Alexandria S. Johnson, Company commander of the 116th USCI, April 9, 1865. We had not been at a halt more than 20 minutes when the news of Lee's surrender reached us. Our brigade celebrated the event by firing volleys of musketry in the air. Officers hugged each other with joy. The men in that long line threw their caps upwards until they looked like a flock of crows. From wood and dale came the sound of cheers from thousands of throats. Appomattox will never hear the like again. 
General Butler testifies before Congress 10 years after the war has ended about a pledge he made during the battle at Petersburg. And as I rode along, guiding my horse this way and that, lest he should profane his hoofs, what seemed to me the sacred dead. As I looked at their bronze faces upturned in the shining sun, as if in mute appeal against the wrongs of the country for which they had given their lives, and whose flag had been to them a flag of stripes in which no glory had ever shone for them. Feeling I had wronged them in the past and believing what was the future duty of my country to them, I swore to myself a solemn oath. May my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if ever I fail to defend the rights of the men who have given their blood for me and my country this day and for their race forever. And God helping me, I will keep that oath. For many of the white officers, it was an experience for them too. It will see these guys to go from being slaves to being soldiers to being citizens and to being citizens in the, in the very most important kind of a way. And because they did their duty and fought like men, they were able to not only win some of these major battles, but they also earned the respect of the Congress of the United States to the point where Congress was willing to pass the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. President Abraham Lincoln. There have been men who have proposed to me to return to slavery the black warriors to conciliate the South. I would be damned in time and eternity for doing so. This nation spent billions of dollars on its general memory. And some of the most uh, avid historians are the descendants of former slave owners. And yet when the, the, the freed descendants attempt to study this, then they said that we are pulling old scabs off of old wounds to no, uh, to no good uh, reason, and for no uh, uh, good reason, and so on. And I say to people that until this nation gets a balanced picture of where it has been, it will continue to be surprised at the negative about people who haven't had a chance to tell the nation where it has been. And you've got to tell the nation the full story. This is not a Walt Disney evolution to the West where there are no tears and where there is no damage. To me, the black man is He's bringing himself up from nowhere into something. To think that he and other fellow slaves went out and sometimes fought in wars without shoes and went weeks without food and stuff like that and still kept on fighting to become free, I just think that's amazing. To me, it means that uh, the community is waking up to the fact that the black man did do a lot during the Civil War. I hate the label black history, yeah, it's about black soldiers. It's part of our history and, it, and it's something we're all proud of. And I think for a lot of years maybe some of these issues have been ignored. As the students work together and, and you see that they are as proud of this work as, as anything. Paul LaRue and his students from Washington Courthouse, Ohio, have a website that lists the locations of the burial sites for all African American Civil War veterans who are buried in the state of Ohio. We have a website which has approximately 3,000 names of USCT soldiers buried in Ohio. We have them in 86 of Ohio's 88 counties. Uh, and we also have, through the information we've gained about our own local community, begun to work on our own cemetery in a, in a actual project to get unmarked graves marked. We were able to go back with the graves registration cards which would verify both military service and where the soldier was buried to have now a website where people can go in and find their relatives and learn about the contributions that the USCT troops made uh, to our country and to our state uh, is really a blessing. This is John Taylor's card, uh, Stephen's great-great-grandfather, Fayette County, and again the key is we were looking for the regiment, in this case it's 116th USCI or Colored Infantry, uh, which showed that he was a African-American Civil War soldier. 
for a teacher like that to just take charge and to take on a research thing like this, I think is great, especially in a small, predominantly white area like this. Getting those kids involved to find out the names and what they did and to learn all the history behind the Civil War and to find grave sites, to even want to put markers up or to reset the stones like they've been doing out at the cemetery, I think his class is just fantastic. He's a great teacher. We're not going to have the forgotten soldiers. We're going to have a group of soldiers who are as well marked as any. On July 18, 1998, the African American Civil War Memorial is dedicated in Washington, D.C. John Taylor is one of the 209,145 names on that memorial wall. My grandfather, John Taylor, was a great man. To point to his name, John Taylor, and to know that he is my great-grandfather and he fought is just wonderful. I hope a lot of people come to find the names of their descendants and become aware of how much our race contributed. Real, real proud to be the grandson of a man that served in this country. John Taylor, the grandpa. Real proud. Real proud of my great-great-grandpa. Freedom, oh, freedom, children, freedom. For the last 10 years or so, we've been working with many families who are digging into their attics and into their suitcases and into their memories and coming up with uh, information about their soldiers. We've got these stories sort of hidden in plain view and nobody ever took the opportunity to raise these up and bring them into the consciousness of our community and also, more importantly, into the textbooks of America where people are either teach or, as I often say, misteach Civil War history every day. They ignore what was the most important thing that happened in the war. Lincoln armed the slaves and permitted them to stand as patriots and therefore they were able to help him shift the military burden of it to the point where the North is able to win the war. That story gets left out all over the country, north and south, east and west. And go 